Hello everyone and welcome to the second in our series of live online events for the Bats in Churches project. Thank you so much for joining us. Today I'm also joined by three brilliant speakers to discuss church buildings as treasure houses of history. But before we get fully stuck into the session, I will just chat for a little bit as a general introduction with some housekeeping bits and that will give anyone who's a little bit late a chance to join us. I will also at this point note that if you're having any technical problems, from what I've heard, um, it's worth logging out and then back in again, and that's likely to sort out those issues. My name is Rachel Arnold, and I'm the Heritage Advisor for the Bats in Churches project. I'm based with the Churches Conservation Trust. For those of you who do not know what the Bats in Churches project is all about, we are a partnership of heritage, church and ecological organisations funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Our aim over five years is to help churches, their communities and their bats live more harmoniously together. Usually our work consists of lots of site visits, surveys, cleaning, uh, training and capital works as well. But unfortunately, because of current restrictions, we're unable to do any of that. Happily, however, we can put together events like this and share our love of churches and bats with our online community. And it's really wonderful that you have all managed to join me today. There are going to be four events in this series, each Wednesday lunchtime in May. If you missed last week's session, it is already available on YouTube to catch up on. This week our focus is churches, how wonderful they are and what amazing things we can find in them. I hope that by the end of today you will have all learned something new and be inspired to visit your local church for the first time or again or visit somewhere that you haven't seen before as soon as lockdown is lifted of course. I'm joined by three amazing speakers today Dermot McCulloch who is Professor Emeritus of the History of the Church at Oxford University, a renowned historical author, columnist and broadcaster, uh, Rachel Morley, who is the director of the Friends of Friendless Churches, a guardian for the Society of the Protection of Ancient Buildings, and a judge on the bon uh, John Betjeman Award. And finally, Janet Berry, who is head of conservation for the Cathedral and Church Buildings Division, or Church Care in the Church of England, and is an active member of the Institute of Conservation. They will each talk for 10 minutes, enlightening us in the wonderful world of churches, and then you will have the chance to ask them questions. Please do ask them anything. You can do this using the Q&A function at, in the Zoom webinar window somewhere. I think it's at the bottom. Or you can tweet us at Bats in Churches using the Bats in Churches live hashtag or get in touch via Facebook. We are also joined by Diana Spencer, who is one of my team members on the Bats in Churches project. She will be responding to the questions on the Q&A screen. The session won't last more than an hour, but how long it does go on for really does depend on how many questions you ask. So please do get them rolling in. Just to reiterate, if you do struggle with the technical side of things, try logging out and back in again, and it should, it should work fine from there. So that's enough of the housekeeping side of things. Let's move on to the main topic and get stuck in. For centuries, churches have been a central point around which communities, villages and towns have developed. They are built as an expression of religious devotion and hundreds of people for hundreds of years have celebrated their major life events in them. We can tell a lot about the local area by looking at churches. The materials and styles that they were built in tells us about the, their wealth, industry and people who lived in the area. It also gives us a bigger picture as to what was going on nationally with religion or society. Churches are also home to some of the nation's most significant historic artifacts, to rival things housed in the British Museum, for example. Individual churches mean a lot to people on very personal levels for different reasons. And I would like to hand over to our first speaker now, Dermot McCulloch, who is going to talk a little bit, a little bit about one particular church. Um, and how his interest in it developed. Um, over to you, Dermot. Thank you. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is a very personal section and a very specific one because it's about a very specific church, St Mary's Weatherden in Suffolk. But it's a happy coincidence that this church is at, well, at the heart of the BAT project. 
uh, and so this is very personal to it and to me because I've known this church uh, since I was four years old when in 1956 my father became rector of Weatherden. We moved into the great rectory there and every Sunday for the next ooh, 16 years I sat in the chancel in the rectory pew with my mother uh, and this is the building which probably I know better than any other building on earth. It, it's very, very important to me. Uh, and it's shaped a life of church crawling. I, I now uh, I, I know an unhealthy amount about churches generally, but the model for it all is this church in Suffolk. An ideal training for a church crawler. Weatherden is sort of every church, like every man. It's got nothing very spectacular. But it's got layer on layer for, let's say, 1,500 years of English church history. To start with, you look at the churchyard. It's basically an oval. And that tells you something very interesting about this church in uh, a rural parish, which is actually square. But at the middle of it is this oval, which tells you straight away that this is the, the enclosure which predates every other enclosure in the village. We don't know quite how old that goes back. I'd love to see a, a sort of very delicate excavation to find out, but I think what we can say is that this is at least an Anglo-Saxon site and probably a rather important one because uh, in my later years I went to manuscripts in the public record office which showed a 16th century rector, one of my father's predecessors, actually conducting an archaeological excavation in his churchyard and he found a chapel alongside the present church and we know from a, a, a medieval will that this chapel is dedicated to a very obscure anglo-saxon saint saint rumwald so straight away i think we're setting up an anglo-saxon minster which we've totally forgotten about in any other written record so that's how old this site is what do you see well you see building a building which has fragments of masonry back to the 12th century it's got a really spectacular 14th century chancel, uh, expensive work, and then some, lots of 15th century things and lots of 16th century things. Well, I'm throwing centuries at you. How did I learn which century was which? Well, I looked at the windows with a lot of guidance. Uh, and you, you, you know what a Gothic window is like. It's got uh, what's called tracery, which is the stone framework in which the glass goes. And that tracery went through fashions. And so us church nuts know the names for each fashion. So that chancel in the 14th century is deck, decorated, and there were later windows uh, with their characteristic forms are perp, perpendicular. So all that takes you through the medieval period and you look at the fittings in this church. One special thing about Weatherton is that uh, all its roofs are pre-Reformation. Every roof in the church dates from before 1530. You've got a spectacular du false double hammer beam roof, getting very technical now, in the nave uh, and uh, other roofs as well. They're all so splendid. Bats, I'm afraid, love them. There is stained glass. Some of the 14th century stained glass is still there in the window in which it was put around 1320. And you go on, there are pews from the 16th, uh, from the 15th century, I think. Uh, and I learned how to distinguish these beautiful pews from copies of them made by a very talented Victorian. Uh, and so you, you learn to touch wood and see uh, how old a piece of wood is simply by touching it. So all that is a lovely, not exceptional, but remarkable set of things. You move on through time. There are box views from the Georgian period. Then a rather sympathetic Victorian restoration, the 20th century, added a very sweet toned organ, for which I acted as organist for some years, but which uh, had been put in uh, in the 1920s as a war memorial, extended in the 1980s and 90s by uh, a, a dedicated organist whose family had played the organ for around half a century in this church. There's all that. You walk outside and that churchyard is wonderfully miscellaneous. It's full of gravestones still. Uh, it's a tre treasure house for wildlife too. That's all thanks to my dad. 
who in the 1960s fiercely resisted the common fashion at the time to turn the churchyard into a sort of lawn, clear out all the gravestones. Well, my dad was a, uh, an obstinate minded man and wouldn't do it. So we've still got this lovely churchyard in its uh, um, state for the last 300 years in front of us now. One thing did stand out, and I'll, I'll sort of end on this because this is really important to me. Uh, in the 15th century, uh, a, a, a wealthy lawyer, called, uh, Sulyard, John Sulyard, moved in to Weatherden, took over the local manor house, and he and his family spent lots of money on this church from the late 15th century into the 16th. So far, so ordinary, loads of families all over England, gentry families were doing this. But in the Reformation, something odd happened to this family of Sulyards. They refused to accept the Reformation. They stayed what would now be known as Roman Catholics. And in theory, they should never have gone to their church by their faith. They became recusants, people who refused to go to church. But they stayed on. Having built a lavish aisle and buried their family in it, they went on loving this church and spending money on it right up to the time when the last male Soyard died in 1799. And when I was a child, I became much more interested in the details of history. This fascinated me. People who should not be there loved the place and went on loving it despite all the traumas of the Reformation. That led me to a fascination with the English Reformation. It led me to a career as a professional historian. So I owe so much to St. Mary's Weatherden and I'd love to see it solve its problems between its devoted parishioners and its bats. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dermot. That was really nice to hear your, um, your connection with a particular church. And it's, um, it's, it's good, actually. I think um, Weatherden have, have responded quite well on the project and they're feeling some of the benefits already. Um, I think they're having a fundraiser, aren't they, for some of the building works that they're doing. So um, it's been coordinated by a very enthusiastic church warden. So if you'd like to visit their website, you can make a, a donation there if you feel you are able. Um, I was just wondering, um, we haven't had any specific questions, um, so I might save this uh, till the end. So um, I was going to ask what if, if you had a favourite period in church history, but I think I will save that and give that as a general question for everybody to think about towards the end. So thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to pass over to, I'll mute you, sorry, uh, and pass over to Rachel Morley. Lovely. From the Friends of Friendless Churches, welcome. Hello, thank you Rachel. Hello everybody. Uh, I am going to share my screen, so if you just bear with me, uh, this should work. Uh, or maybe not. Go. Do, do, do. Okay, here we are. So, um, hello, I'm Rachel Morley. I'm from the Friends of Friendless Churches, um, and I'm going to take a slightly different approach to, um, to Dearmid, and I'm going to talk about, um, uh, well, maybe not totally different, I'm going to talk about experiencing churches, but not a specific church, um, uh, just kind of in general. So, if I go on like this, so something that you always hear is that the parish church tells the story of England. I find that so boring and what an absolute poverty of imagination. For me, the parish church tells the story of the universe. The parish church is a time crash. It's a head rush of place. It's the past, it's the present, it's the future. It's all bundled into one building. And the parish church puts our very small lives into context. Within us, we carry the genes, the culture and the memories of our ancestors and what we think about them influences ourselves, um, uh, what we think about ourselves and how we make sense of our time, our place and our lives. The parish church isn't like a castle or a pub. They are the spiritual investment of generations and not only the spiritual investment, but also the artistic investment and the human endeavor. And I believe, unlike any other building, 
these buildings carry the genes, cultures and memory of our past. And I want to say how literally they can carry the genes of our past. You have horse hair and plaster mixes, you have sweat in mortar, and here, this example from St. Bothel's Hardham in Sussex, you have um, urine in the green paint. So this is really interesting. This is an Annunciation scene, um, and this is the angel Gabriel, and his um, halo is created of green paint, whereby they had um, sheets of copper, they coated it in salt, and then they put honey on it, and then they dipped it into a tank of urine and buried it for two weeks, scraped it off, green paint. There you go. Um, but also you have things like, you know, thumbprint, thumbprints in bricks and yes, um, and kind of various um, things like that. So the buildings physically carry our genes, I think. In one of the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, I don't really need to say, um, Eustace says, in our world, a star is a huge ball of flaming gas. Romandu replies, even in your world, my son, that is not what a star is, but only what a star is made of. So I could tell you all about the art and craft and architecture and the archaeology of these places, but I'm going to guess that since you're tuning in here, you probably already know about that. So in my few minutes, I want to try and talk to you, not what churches are made of, but what they are. And what they are is very individual. Your experience will be different to mine. I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm going to have a try. Um, I once worked with uh, a really wonderful person who described uh, going into churches a bit like this scene from uh, Michael Jackson's Billie Jean video. The paving slabs are dark and cold until your feet touch them and then they light up just for you. I really love that. Uh, so I thought I'd have to get that in there. I think in parish churches, you can experience art and history in a way like no other. It meets you in your own time and on your own terms. Much of the art and architecture in parish churches is, being worthy of an, of, of, is worthy of being in any national museum, but the wonderful thing is it's not. It's in context, and whether that context is languishing on a desolate headland, holding fort amid an oil refinery, or slumped in weary majesty on a roadside. This is Warkton, St. Edmund's Warkton in Northamptonshire. It's a small, pretty English village. And inside you have these niches with these types of sculptures. This is not like, this is, this is insane. This is not normal to have this in a little, little medieval village. Um, but in this church, you can walk up and you can touch the sculptures. You can stroke st sculptures by um, Rebiliac. I mean, try doing that in the, the v &A. Actually, don't, uh, don't try and do that in the V&A. I wouldn't uh, recommend that. <laughs> but it's here and it's waiting for you all over the country in England. But to really get going, I want to talk about this church. This is St. Dennis's East Hatley in Cambridgeshire. This is what it looks like today. What it looked like about 15 years ago was this, but we, uh, we won't talk about that now. The nave was built in 1217 and it's built by local labour and built from field stones. So that is local people went to this field, they picked pebbles and cobbles from the field um, and they bound them in sand, mud and lime to create their church. In terms of geology, East Hatley is in the Galt formation. So it's mudstones, siltstones these st uh, and, and flints. And those are formed with skeletons um, of tiny organisms, you know, millions of years old. The clays and the sands form this superficial geological layer. But what is the sand? But it's the past pulverized. It's a mountain, it's a boulder formed millions of years ago, eroded down to the tiniest particle. And within these grains are tiny manifestations of ancient worlds and landscapes. And perhaps within the tiniest grain of sand in a mortar mix, there is an imprint, a memory of the mountain it came from, the journey it made, the life it once lived. So memory is a hugely important part of the parish church. That's just another picture of some mortar in case uh, you didn't know what mortar looked like. But memory is a hugely important part of the parish church. Within the parish church, memory is individual and collective. In these places, you can hear the centuries of faith in the cold stone. 
you can feel the slow passing of time. Not only can you hear it and feel it, but you can see it. In the porch here at uh, Caldecott Church, you can see the step worn down by countless faith, faithful feet. You can see greasy marks on monuments that people have touched time and time again, either out of devotion or mindlessness or just because they like the way it feels under their fingers. You see it in graffiti, some holy, some irreverent, and some symbols of bygone times that we just we cannot understand. You see it in the hassocks, lovingly stitched by someone's hands, worn threadbare from their praying knees. Now, obviously, John Ruskin can put this better than anyone else because he is John Ruskin. So I'll just say a couple of lines from him. He says, the greatest glory of a building is not in its stones nor in its gold. Its glory is in its age and in that deep sense of voicefulness, of stern watching, of mysterious sympathy, which we feel in the walls that have long been washed by the passing waves of humanity. But this age is such a fragile thing. It's vulnerable. This is Chalfon St. Giles Church. The picture is not great, but I really love this wall painting from 1330. Um, and you can see how it's kind of just hanging in there. You know, the, 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 the paint is flaking. It's kind of suspended in time. It's so, it's so vulnerable. And that, I think that's what the great conflict about these places is. What special actually puts them at risk? I deal with redundant churches. Churches the church doesn't want. The parish has walked away, the church has walked away, but the building goes on. Its, important doesn't, its importance doesn't diminish because of this. And I find the reason that these places are so moving is that deep sense of humanity. These places transcend time or race or religion because of the concentration of shared human experience within their walls. These are places where people silently poured out their hopes and fears, where they had their happiest and saddest moments. These churches are often the only monument to the lives of hundreds of people, the people that history has forgotten. And here, there, this is a song of centuries. Um, yep, uh, that, was, that was to go with the, the lives that people have, for, uh, history has forgotten, but uh, maybe, maybe not the best image actually, in kind of hindsight. So um, I don't want to go all mis Mystic Meg, but I do want to talk very briefly about thin places. So this is a Celtic term, but it's an ancient idea. And it's about when the dis it's a place where the distance between heaven and earth collapses and the connection between the divine or to the past becomes profoundly close. There are thresholds, gateways, bridges to, to the divine or to another world. And these, this idea has long held a place in religion and in folklore. So for me, these are places uh, that are all about the relationship between ancient landscapes and ancient churches. Landscape and setting with churches really cannot be underestimated. And for me, the place that best describes the thin place is St. Baglin in Clan Baglin in Gwynedd, which is Wales. So I'm sorry, I'm kind of just jumping over uh, the border for a few minutes. Um, but what makes this place special? Is it the sentient landscape? Is it the ancient shady mountains that watch humans arrive? Is it the clump of gnarled trees stretching their branches protectively around the church? Or is it the ever breathing, ever changing, rhythmic slow sea right on its doorstep? This church was built within the pre-Christian settlement and it was built understanding its landscape. This is, uh, I took this photo in uh, the end of 2018 and no photo can do justice to this moment that I had in this church. It, the sun was setting and just before it dipped under the Menai Straits, it, it, the, the light shot up under the eaves as you can, as you can see on the, um, on the photograph here. But for just about two minutes, the interior of this church blazed orange and then the light extinguished and it was all over. And it was so beautiful and it was so powerful, but that wasn't an accident. You know, they understood what they were doing when they were building this. And I guess I would say, you know, introducing electric light here would totally destroy that experience. But anyway, I'll come back to that in a second. 
So St. Baglins has six century gravestones built into its wall. There's a healing well close by. There are carved split symbols that speak of meaning, values, and beliefs. There are polite oiled woodwork of 18th century families. The interior is close and the walls are damp. But to simply rattle off this list of things is a reductive experience. In a historic church like this, your experience will be saturated with meaning, but whose meaning cannot be put into words. And perhaps this, this experience is due to the accumulation of hundreds upon hundreds of ideas over hundreds of years. Their realizations, revelations, hopes, fears, and actions. And that the landscape in which these, which these churches sit is an active and shaping force in our imagination, our language, and our relations with others, um, each other and the world. So for me, St. Baglins, like so many other parish churches, offers a rare glimpse into the soul of things. So I said about electric light, just a tip to go back to that very quickly. I guess no building has the right to an eternal life. They long outlive the purposes they were built, the technologies by which they were constructed, and the aesthetics that determined their form. They experience endless subtractions, additions, divisions, multiplications, just so you know that I can do all of the maths. And the great paradox of buildings is that they're only preserved through incremental change. And for me, it's that incremental change that is so endlessly fascinating. The it's the changes in use and users that imparts its rich history. So I'm not at all for the fossilization of these places, but I think let's take a long view. Let's think in terms of centuries and not just within our own lifetime. That a church may sit in a field without a function for half a century really doesn't worry me. Throughout their history, these places have ebbed and flowed. It's the rise and fall that makes them interesting. And in these buildings, we have the most magnificent cultural and spiritual legacy. And from my line of work, I know just how vulnerable they are. As an example. There's so much more to say, and I realize I have barely spoke about, you know, the light, the sounds, the smells, you know, dust, furn furniture polish, rattle of hot water pipes to get a little bit of betumen in there. But I'm going to end here and I'm going to end with a few lines from W.H. Uh, Auden and from his, um, from his poem, As I Walked Out One Evening. The glacier knocks in the cupboard, the desert sighs in the bed, and the crack in the teacup opens, a lane to the land of the dead. Thank you. Amazing, Rachel. Thank you so much. Um, that was really really moving and I'm sure everybody will feel um yeah very touched uh, about future experiences with churches um there are a few questions I will come I will come back to all of your questions at the end there's some really good ones rolling in um I'll hand over now to uh Janet Berry um and I'll just adjust the videos thank you very, very much Church of, Church of England Thank, Thank you very much, Rachel. And I'm just going to share my screen with you. Uh, that's the wrong screen, I think. Is it? No, is that the right screen? I'm getting a thumbs up from Rachel. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, Thank you so much for inviting me to talk today. Uh, the presentations so far have been so fantastic and so insightful and really actually explain why I love my work for the Church of England. What I'm going to talk about is buildings and conservation for mission. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Church of England and, and our buildings, and I'm going to give you a little insight into my work in conservation. So to start off, I'll go through a few key facts about the Church of England. So we have 15,700 Anglican parish churches, and 42 cathedrals. 78% of our church buildings are listed. So that means they are of high heritage significance. And we're responsible for nearly half of England's grade one listed buildings. So that's buildings that are considered to be of exceptional significance in England. So we have an incredibly rich heritage and a huge responsibility for their care. Now, 
all 15,700 of those parish churches are usually in use, obviously with the present circumstances as an exception. And in fact, apparently the last time all our church buildings were closed was when King John was excommunicated from the Catholic Church by Rome 800 years ago. So we are living in exceptional circumstances. But usually our church buildings are open and they are in use. And as Rachel and Dermot pointed out, our objects are still in situ. So our historic buildings are in use. Our windows still have to keep the weather out of the building. Our chalices are used to drink wine out of every Sunday when we're not in lockdown. Our screens, our medieval screens are still used as partitions between different parts of a building. And our altar cloths are still used in rotation according to the liturgical calendar. And for me, this is the real beauty and this is the passion that I feel for our churches. You can hold a 300 year old silver chalice in your hands. You can sit in those Georgian box pews or on the Victorian pews and take in the wonder of our churches. You can visit our cathedrals and you can prop yourself against our medieval misericords and try very hard not to make them crush down as they would have done in the past if you were falling asleep in a service to alert everybody to the fact that you were falling asleep. Really best to try and keep those upright. You can also consider, as a medieval person would have, the paths to hell and damnation, damnation as Rachel's picture so vividly portrayed, or salvation as you look at a doom painting. So our historic interiors help us to connect with our past, but they also help us to realise how we feel now and how we work in the future. And I'd like to move on now to talk about my work in conservation, just a little bit of the kind of work that I do, and look at how our objects are actually helping us look after our buildings. So this is a side that perhaps you may not be aware of when we look at, build, when we look at um, objects. I look at them slightly differently as a conservator. The objects in our buildings are generally made from materials that are more sensitive to change and more susceptible to changes in a church building. And that turns them into what I call the canary in the cage. So quite often they can be the first indicator that there may be a bigger issue in a building. And I'm going to talk now about a case study at Ravenstone, Ravenstone All Saints in the Diocese of Oxford. It's an absolutely beautiful building and when we're out of uh, lockdown I would definitely recommend going to see this church. There's a monument in there which is a 17th century marble memorial to Sir Hennage Finch, apologies if I've pronounced his name wrong, and on a Sunday morning, the quality of the carving is such that you can see the marble curtains uh, on, a sunny, on a sunny morning when the light streams through, it actually streams through the curtain, through the marble, and they act as though they are real curtains. It's absolutely gorgeous. But the parish were first of all concerned when they noticed on the monument, there is a coat of arms. And they noticed that there was flaking paint on the heraldic shield. And this led to a series of investigations by conservators, by archeologists, and by the architect. And it was revealed that in addition to the flaking paint, there was actually structural movement in the monument. And further investigations revealed that there were problems with water ingress in the walls and in the floor and on the windows of the side chapel in the church. So this hinted that there was actually a bigger problem than just uh, flaking of the paint and deterioration of the monument itself. And from these investigations, problems with drainage around the side chapel were addressed. The monument itself was stabilised and conserved. 
And so through the um, vigilance of the church wardens, noticing the problem with the memorial, bigger problems with the building were addressed before more serious damage occurred to that building, which would have been more expensive to repair. And so this is why looking at, a, looking at our um, historic interiors and looking after our historic interiors is very important to give us an indication about what's happening in the building itself. So my time is quite short, so I hope that's actually given you a snapshot of why I love our church buildings and in particular our historic interiors and our collections and why looking after our interiors is so important so that they can contribute to the continued mission and the glory of our churches so that we can keep them open and sustainable for all. And for those wishing to know more about our parish churches, I'm sure there will be lots of questions about this, how do you find out more? I put a couple of websites up here. We have our own resources at Church Care, which is the Cathedral and Church Buildings Division within the Church of England. You can also find out more about the heritage of churches from the church heritage record. And post lockdown, if you want to go and visit our churches, you can look on, our, on the website, a church near you. Thank you ever so much for listening. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Janet. That was really fantastic. Um, I, I'm, I feel immensely proud to be able to work in heritage conservation as well and helping churches look after their, um, their interiors. Um, it's a real challenge to care for some of the items, but I agree in what, what several of you, well, all of you have said that it's really important that they remain in the buildings where they belong and can be enjoyed in their original context. So we're now just going to have a bit of a, I'm going to take that off and hopefully um, go to a four speaker view. Um, and we'll have a little bit of a, a discussion um, following on from some of the questions that have been um, asked over in the, in, in the Q&A panel. So firstly, there was one for, um, one for uh, Dermot actually, which was um, to do with pre-Reformation uh, sculpture and whether you think that there would be, whether there would have been lots more statues in places um, for example, there's a church uh, of St. Dunstan in Bonhurst in Bedfordshire, and would that have had, um, would that have had a statue of St. Dunstan? Bear with me, I need to unmute you. There you go. You've unmuted me. Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. There would have been lots and lots of sculpture, enormous amounts of it, and the English Reformation was extremely destructive of it. Uh, because it actually contravenes one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt make no graven images. So uh, Protestants being Bible-based people got rid of a lot. Uh, quite often they didn't actually get rid of the whole thing, they smashed the head off, uh, with thus destroying the power of the images, why you, which is why you get so many headless images all over the place. But every parish church would have its patron saint, and it would have an image of uh, Our Lady, St. Mary, these are two basic kit images. And also, by the end of the Middle Ages, over the great screen which divided the nave and the chancel, uh, the rood screen, there would be the, the rood, which is the figure of Christ on the cross, flanked by, again, his mother and the beloved disciple John. That, that's, again, basic minimum kit. And uh, the reformers, Protestant reformers of the 16th century, got rid of virtually every rood in the country. I think of, of yeah, 15,000 or more, there are now two. And uh, we've now got lots of imagery back, sculpture in particular, because of the Victorians, because of the Oxford movement, uh, because of the Church of England's rethinking of itself. Is it Protestant? Is it Catholic? An ongoing debate. Uh, but um, now you've got uh, the remains of medieval sculpture, you've got Victorian sacred sculpture, but as we've already seen, we also got lots and lots of sculpture in tombs. So after the Reformation, it's fine to have Sir Henry Finch lying there, uh, but not Our Lady. Brilliant, thank you, Dermot. That was yeah, perfect. I think um, it's always really nice to hear um, and see surprising survivors through the Reformation. I always find that really fascinating. I've got um, I'll, I'll mute everyone now, but I've got some um, 
a, well, there's a question directed um, to you, Rachel, actually, but I'd like to hear what everybody else thinks about it as well. And it was, what are your thoughts for the, for the future of the parish church? Ooh, <laughs> that's such a big question. Um, I, um, oh, it's so easy to be pessimistic, <laughs> but I, um, uh, I'm really worried about the future of the parish church, basically. I think, um, I, and there are a few reasons, um, and I'll try and be very quick about it. I guess my first reason is that there was a big report done in 2017, um, the Taylor Review, that was meant to look into the sustainability of churches. It said that if a church doesn't have a viable community or um, alternative use, then it is, it's non-viable. Um, and I just thought that that was really worrying because there are lots of rural churches. Um, I think, you know, the, golly, um, there's like, is it like 20% of churches are where like 9% of the population is, but also we know that the number of worshippers in rural areas is going down. I know this is a generalization um, and their worship, uh, worship numbers are going up in other places, but I just thought that was, that was really worrying because this was the big government report that was meant to tell us um, was meant to offer solutions and saying that a church is unviable isn't offering a solution. Um, I, um, so that makes me worried. Um, and I think things like the um, Heritage Lottery Fund at the time, it's obviously without consultation 2017, cut its dedicated stream of funding for churches. Now churches are up against it um, with every other building. And I think I do think churches are different, um, not just in terms of the building, but you know they're they're often kind of um, a group a, a group of um, a small group of people in the PCC trying to put together a big professional application for funding and putting together you know public engagement and all of these types of things, and they might just want to like you know fix a roof, and suddenly they've got to have you know huge plans of activities, and it's it's off putting, but also because now there isn't a stream for funding, that's going to be difficult. I think we're going to see the effects of that. Um, I think we already are seeing the effects of that. It's, this is it's, it's coming up to three years since it's been cancelled, um, and I think um, yeah, I think I I think churches will be in a worse state of repair because of it, and uh, parishes won't be able to keep going. Um, uh, I also think very quickly, um, closing churches, oh, churches are closed, all churches are closed at the moment. I'm worried about how many will actually reopen. Um, I mean, I think when you think of uh, historic houses saying, you know, within, if they have to close for three months, um, only like 50%, I think they've said, will, will be able to weather that lack of income for three months. Um, I think I'd be interested to know if there's a projection for churches, because obviously, they rely on, um, you know, donations and all of these types of things to make their parish share. Um, but also, um, yeah, if you're allowed to worship from your kitchen, uh, what's the point in trying to go to a church again? But uh, maybe everything I've said there is probably desperately controversial. So um, I'll hand over to somebody else. Yes, do Janet. I wonder how um, how you feel about any of that. From a, from Thank you. A... I'll, I'll do the positives. Like <laughs> to, to Rachel's, uh, no, Rachel's negatives, and I think that actually the question ties in nicely. I've seen there's another question here about um, post coronavirus. Um, what's the future of our church buildings? We are working. Um, so my division works within the National Churches Institutions, and we are working. Um, very, very hard with our parish churches, with our dioceses, with our cathedrals, to look at the impact of the virus on our operations. Um, and yes, it's not a pretty picture. It's not a pretty picture for everyone at the moment. Um, but this is giving us that opportunity to look at how church is being done differently. Um, for all the people who might say, well, do you know why do we need our church buildings? There are so many others who are saying, we're so desperate to get back into our church buildings. Please, when can we? Um, and so we're looking at how can we take um, what we can from going online and doing church in our kitchens, um, and how can we use our church buildings moving forward into the future? So we are considering all those questions, and we're looking at that very hard. Um, there's also, whilst there are church buildings, they are closed at the moment. 
they have become focal points in many communities, for example, where they're operating food banks and church buildings are in so many locations that only public space that's left available. So we're actually um, working with many of our dioceses and many of the parishes um, in trying to uh, build up that community use of churches. We saw, for example, during the recent flooding in Yorkshire, Fish Lake St Cuthbert became the centre of its, of its um, local community because the church was built on the high ground and therefore it wasn't flooded and therefore it could offer support to those who were flooded. So whilst we are being thrown um, these very big challenges, it's also throwing up opportunities and making us rethink what are our church buildings for and how can we use them. So I see it as I see it as, as, as a more positive situation. That's not to say it's all plain sailing because it's not. Um, there are challenges that we have to face, but it is, it's not as, um, uh, as negative, I think. <laughs> I, I see it slightly positively. I also see the current Bats in Churches project as a huge positive step forward. This is a five year opportunity for us to really get to grips with the issues with church buildings and um, with bats and with our church communities. Look at ways in which we can um, uh, look at how bats can either stay in our buildings or are there alternatives available and really assess how they're working and the impact that that is having on local communities. So I see there are actually lots of positives happening within this whole situation. Can I, can I, can I come in very quickly? Yes, yes. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I completely, like Janet, I completely agree. Um, I guess, um, I guess the reason why I'm, there are lots of good things going on. I guess the reason why I'm worried is, um, I think that if a church closes, it, it has a use seeking period for, I think about, is it like 18, 24 months or something like that? And I just think for a building that has stood for so long to be given a use seeking period of such a short period of time, I think that really worries me and I think it can take years for opportunities to develop um, and um, you know some of our churches haven't had anything happening at them for 40 years and then suddenly people are interested people are back um, and it has a really a burst of life and I guess that's why I was kind of saying it can sit in the field for 50 years that doesn't bother me we kind of just keep the show on the road and then people can come back but no there are it's not to say that there aren't great things happening and people are really working so hard, I know, to, to make good things happen. So, thank you. Yeah, I yes. On this. Uh, I, yes, I quite, couldn't agree more with Rachel. I, I, I hear all the alarmist things she said, uh, but uh, she put up, for instance, a picture of East Hatley in Cambridgeshire. Now, there's an example of a church which was abandoned uh, when I was an undergraduate. So more than half a century ago, and it was in a terrible state. And now look at it, it's the focus of the community again. And I, I would be positive. I did a little exercise last summer. I went on a church crawl in South Norfolk, an area which my mum and dad had church crawled in 1964. And I would say of all the churches I saw, they were all in a better state now than they had been in 1964. The society had changed the esteem of, of, of these buildings uh, uh, was still there, but different. They were now the focuses of a community in which there were no other focuses in many cases. Uh, and, and again, one of them, a place called Fawnsit, had a church which was closed in the 1970s, fell into a terrible state. Local people rallied around. They said, we want this building. And they restored it. And I was there as the scaffolding was around the tower. It, it was extremely, exciting and inspiriting so uh let's be positive let's realize that there are real dangers at the moment and one is the loss of that funding stream which rachel emphasized that that's really bad but yeah. something must happen about that to uh, reverse that process uh, but there is so much goodwill out there churches are loved by people who don't go to services and that's great these are places at the center of their community as the church of england claims it is Thank you so much. That was a really, um, a really fruitful discussion. Um, we've had a comment which um, was recommending uh, a few websites. So Suffolk Churches, for example, .co.uk, which is really a, a great resource 
for visiting churches. I think there's a Norfolk one as well and probably an Essex one under development too. Um, and a question from um, a Miss Sawyer. Uh, if you have a local church that is fascinating, what is the best way to start researching history? And it was, I wondered if you had any uh, tips on perhaps um, books that people could use or anything like that um, to get people started. Um, I guess um, the, like Pevsner is Pev, you know Pevsner's the guy. You have to go to him first of all. But I mean, um, I know the books are expensive these days, and you may not have those. So, um, uh, if it's going to be a listed church, it uh, it will have a it will have a listing on the Historic England Register, and that's always a good. That's a good way of kind of getting the bones of what you're going to see. Um, so yeah, um, in kind of very general terms. Um, uh, Pevsner and, uh, and a list description are kind of the the, the, the skeleton that you can kind of... Um, to, to I'd agree, but uh, what I'd say for, is actually surf the net first, just put the, the, the name of the church into Google and see what you come up with. Uh, and very often there will be something which will ease you into the Pevsner language. <laughs> it, it does need a little deciphering. Uh, and, and very often there's a, there's a wonderful site for, for Norfolk, for instance, uh, about each church and it, it's beautifully accessible with pics. So use the net and then go to books. I, I, I would agree. Um, I trawled my bookshelf uh, this morning looking at books that I have and I found this one, which is how to read churches. Um, because Pevsner is great if you understand his language. Uh, whereas this book uh, goes into, for example, I talked about Misericords um, and this one talks about stalls and what a Misericord is and it goes into, into much detail about what the languages that we use. We also, um, uh, there's another book by Matthew Rice, Matthew Rice, which is called The Rice Church Primer, which is one I would recommend, which is, um, again, it's a book for those who don't quite um, know where to start with their churches and how to start with them. So those are two books that I would definitely recommend. Fab, thank you. And just a second, um, the, the bit about the Pesna, even if you can't afford a uh, full set or anything, there's the, your local library will have a copy for your area at least. So you can always um, check that out, I think. Um, let me just see if there are any more. Um, I think we've got time for one more. Um, a slightly more general one, maybe, um, perhaps more uh, aimed towards Dermot and your knowledge of, you were talking about churchyards earlier. Um, yew trees are common in churchyards. Um, is there any particular thing that church crawlers should look out for when looking at yew trees, yew trees for example, um, size or position, etc.? Yeah, um, they are fascinating and immensely old. Uh, one tip, don't try and eat them. Uh, because they are poisonous and one theory as to why they're in churchyards is to is deter farmers from allowing their animals in uh, in case they chew them but I think there's a, a, a more si a significant interesting reason yew trees were sacred uh, before Christianity came along they uh, retain that thought of sacredness because they are so old uh, and that's what's significant uh, they, they, they can be well, a thousand years old. These are some of the oldest living things that you'll meet. Uh, and they are very often placed beside the, the main entrance. Sometimes you'll, you'll get later ones, Victorians like them too, putting on gloomy graves. But you'll be able to tell the difference. You can date them by the size of them. Uh, so there are all sorts of fascinations about yew trees, but uh, definitely don't try a snap a snack on them. Oh, yeah, top tip. Thank you. Advice. Um, I've just been googling um, because there is a um, an ancient U website, which um, whenever we visit a church building, uh, when we visit a church, and if we think that there may be an ancient U there, then we look up. We use this website to look up about um, the um, the U's, um, and it tells you all about. It's got Church of England, Church in Wales. Um, how to find an old you, how to look after them, and they've got a, a website that you can search for if you're looking for you. So lots of information from that website. So if you if you type in ancientyou.org with a hyphen between ancient and you, then you'll find out loads about yous. 
It's a fantastic website. Fab. Thank you. I didn't know you trees. Well, I didn't really know you trees could be so fascinating. That's amazing. Um, I think, yeah, I think we'll have to um, finish there. Uh, that's all we have time for on the on the question side of things. Um, if there were any left on the um, on the Q and A on Twitter or on Facebook, uh, we'll do our best to answer them either today or over the next couple of days. Um, and we'll, we'll publish the answers on our Twitter page using the hashtag Bats in Churches Live. If you do have any more pressing questions that you want one of our panellists in particular, in particular to answer, do get in touch with us via the contact page on our website and we will do our best to get those questions answered. Um, the website is batsandchurches.org. Before I finish off completely, I do just want to touch briefly on the work that the Bats and Churches Project are doing to help churches with roosting bat colonies. I know a lot of you tuning into this talk care immensely about churches and protecting the things inside them. And we, we do know that, that bats cause a lot of damage, but I hope that we've given you a bit of an impression about how much we too love churches and are really focused on helping them. Um, helping churches look after both the buildings, the historic artifacts inside them, and the bats. Um, although work has been cut short this year, we've already had some positive outcomes at several of our churches. And for more details and individual stories, as well as our project aims, you can have a look at our website. Uh, all that remains to be said is thank you so much to Dermot, Rachel and Janet for taking the time to talk to us today. You've all been wonderful. I'm sure that you will agree that we are so lucky to have churches on our doorstep that we can explore and that are home to such nationally significant collections of items. And it is really important that we support them, visit them and just enjoy them. And I for one feel so privileged to be able to do that. After you log off here, there'll be a little link on the screen for a very short survey. It's only three questions long and it would really help us if you could complete it. Um, it'll also come in uh, email if you miss the screen. Do join us next week when Claire Boothby will be joined by some colleagues to talk about discovering bats through their DNA. Um, follow us on Twitter at Bats in Churches, Facebook at Bats in Churches Project, and sign up to our newsletter via our website at batsinchurches.org. And that is all from all of us. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. Goodbye. <laughs>